the ropes. Casey, I just have to say, I love that you have a new picture like every week. <laughs> it just makes me happy. <laughs> So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. It looks like we're not going to have a ton of people here today, which is fine because there's really not <coughs> a ton of material left to cover. In fact, I'm just going to stay seated. <laughs> Hope y'all are okay with that. Um, so I have a PowerPoint prepared to do um, the alternatives to traditional prosecution uh, and then um, what we'll do is I have the books PowerPoint for uh, punishment. Um, I've actually, they got, again, it's different pacing when we're not in person, right? So I've actually gotten through material a little more quickly than I anticipated. Um, so typically I just have people read <laughs> the part about punishment and sentencing. Um, and so I will just sort of give you the high points of the book PowerPoint. It's like 80 some odd slides. We're not gonna go through all that, um, but certainly we can touch on uh, the biggest pieces of that. <clears throat> so let me go ahead and share screen here. And then on Tuesday, what we will do, um, get in presentation mode here. On Tuesday, what we will do is we are going to watch a documentary about uh, the Stanford prison experiment. So it's not the original Stanford prison experiment video, which you may have seen, uh, like in Dr. Jackson's class, for example. Um, it's a documentary the BBC did about it. So I like it for the reason that it's a little bit more critical. Um, the problem with the original Stanford experiment video is that Zimbardo created it. And so it's clearly from his perspective. All right. And we touched on some of the stuff at the beginning uh, of the semester as well. It's kind of mentioned in a couple different places in your book. Um, but I thought it would be good to revisit it and talk about it a little more formally. So uh, most cases will be resolved through negotiation as we've talked about so far. So maybe a settlement, maybe, you know, some sort of plea deal or by what's called alternative dispute resolution, also abbreviated ADR. Uh, as we mentioned already, very few cases are actually settled in trials. So in 2009, only 1.2% of federal cases were actually decided in a trial, <clears throat> federal civil cases. And in 2002, only 4.7% of criminal cases were actually go, went to trial. So that means what, 95 plus percent are resolved in some other way. Many cases are settled with negotiation um, and that would be without the assistance of any kind of third party. So negotiation can be formal, uh, which happens for example, when management and union representatives negotiate a labor contract, or it could be informal, like a collaborative divorce where the couple kind of just sits down and figures out the terms of the divorce together. And you might be like, does that happen? Yeah, there are actually couples who just realize 
you know, we're not great married, <laughs> but, you know, especially if they have kids, they might stay friends, for example. So um, it can be, uh, you know, resolved pretty amicably. So arbitration is one form of ADR. And when the parties agree to binding arbitration, they agree to accept the, the decision of an arbitrator. Arbitrator, there we go. <laughs> For some reason, words. End of the semester, just gonna chalk it up to that. If it's non-binding, then if one of the parties is dissatisfied with that decision by the arbitrator, then that person may ask that the case actually go to trial in front of either a judge or jury, depending. Arbitration, whether binding or non-binding, actually does use trial-like procedures. The parties present evidence and argue the case, and the arbitrator makes a decision. In recent years, arbitration, though, has been criticized for being overly formal and time-consuming. People have argued, like, if this suppo is supposed to save time, it's not, right? If this is supposed to be not a trial, it sure feels like one. So a summary jury trial is like a convention tri conventional jury trial, but shorter in duration. So lawyers tell jurors what the witnesses would say if they were present rather than actually calling witnesses. The lawyers argue the case and try to answer jurors' questions about the fact. The judge tells the jury what the law is and tries to answer the jurors' questions about the law. Then the jurors go and deliberate. And in recent years, verdicts from a summary jury trial have become binding and enforceable. So it's called a summary jury trial because the lawyers are summarizing things. Again, rather than calling in the witnesses in front of the jury. So this procedure, this process educates the lawyers and clients on how a conventional jury might view the facts in the law. And once educated, the lawyers and their clients are more amenable to settling the case a lot of the times. All right, then there's mediation, which we mentioned, um, I believe Tuesday, maybe last Thursday. But in mediation, you're gonna use a neutral person, the mediator, to work with the litigants and their lawyers to achieve a settlement. The mediator does not have authority to decide the controversy, but rather acts as a facilitator, meeting with each party in an effort to broker an agreement. People often prefer mediation because they are risk averse. So they prefer controversies to be settled by them rather than decided for them, say by a judge. And compared to litigated divorces, research suggests that mediation encourages the parents to comply with divorce agreements. That's a big thing, so that doesn't always happen. Encourages parents to remain involved in their children's lives and to renegotiate relationships in a more adaptive way. So mediation gets as close as you can to informal negotiation, basically, but with a professional helping you get there. Now, what are some of the beliefs about ADR? What do, what do people tend to favor? So participants favored options that offered them control. So like a neutral third party helping disputants to arrive at their own resolutions, and processes that allowed disputants to control their own presentation of evidence. So people like when they feel like they're in control. So should courts force litigants to try ADR before settling a case for trial uh, or setting a case for trial? Attorneys like the process. Attorneys believe it is fair and that it saves their clients time and money. However, mandatory ADR can lead to an unintended effect. So some lawyers will file meritless claims knowing their claims will have a settlement value in mediation. So just like we talked about the other day in terms of um, you know, awards in lawsuits, right? Your ceiling is going to determine where that eventually comes out, right? 
So if you can add some stuff to it, then that means your person gets stuff added to it. And as the attorney, you typically get a percentage of that. So you're upping your own uh, net worth. Even. All right. So what about community alternatives? And we've, again, kind of mentioned these at the beginning of the semester. We talked about uh, Judge Enoch, right? So problem solving courts were developed to rehabilitate and monitor individuals in the community rather than incarcerate them. And these alternatives pertain to criminal law only. So three major justifications have been offered for the development and expansion of these community options. So the first is humanitarianism. Uh, so you know, trying to avoid cruel and unusual punishments. The second is cost. It's much less expensive to monitor and treat an offender in a community than it is to incarcerate them, where you have to provide them food and shelter, etc. And then the third is that correctional facilities house inmates who, as a group, have wide ranging rehabilitation needs. When populations are more homogenous, like in mental health or drug treatment settings, and security concerns are fewer, then you can get more specialized in your treatment, more intensive in your treatment, and be much more likely to actually help that person, as opposed to if they're in, you know, prison with a whole bunch of violent offenders and, you know, they weren't one. So the sequential intercept model, which was um, developed by Monetes and Griffin in 2006, identifies five stages of the criminal justice process at which standard steps could be interrupted and you could do an alternative community treatment instead. So this is like at any of these steps, you could say, hmm, let's stop here, let's do a community alternative um, instead of putting them through the whole process. So for law enforcement and emergency services, uh, we've mentioned the crisis intervention team, um, then, which provides police and other frontline responders with an enhanced knowledge and behavioral skills for use when they encounter individuals who may be experiencing a mental health crisis. CIHC trained police officers reported better preparation for handling interactions with those experiencing a behavioral health crisis. They were more likely to help individuals obtain mental health services and were less likely to use physical force. Uh, in addition, if those people did end up detained, they were in jail for fewer days. So the CIT training really does seem to make a difference. And I think I shared with you before, I've been on the like training side of that. Um, and it was honestly fun uh, because the, these, the people who were being trained by me at least were people who had been in the field for quite some time. And so they had some great stories and some great reactions to things that I was talking about because they had clearly run into some of these types of folks in the field. All right, so then post arrest, um, this would be the initial detention or initial hearing and the pre-trial services. So that sort of like between arrest and trial stuff we walked through. So if an individual is arrested, then the second intercept occurs at the first appearance before a judge. In some jurisdictions, there's a specialized team that functions as part of the court system, actually identifying defendants who would be appropriate for diversion out of the system at this point for behavioral health treatment. For this intercept, investigators have noted that diverted individuals had more time in the community afterwards, fewer hospital days, so fewer days they're hospitalized, fewer arrests, and less homelessness. So this is very effective, right? It's a part of the problem if you actually like put someone all the way through the trial and they um, serve time is when they come out, they haven't really been fixed, right? They've just been in there. So this gives them the skills and the support and the help to be able to, um, you know, avoid recidivism and possibly even become contributing members of society again. Uh, then there is at, uh, this is <laughs> uh, supposed to be saying, uh, 
post initial hearings rather than post your initial hearings, which I kind of like now. Um, so this is the stage at which problem solving courts, also called specialty courts, uh, such as drug courts, mental health courts, uh, domestic violence courts, homelessness courts, and community courts have been developed. And we'll talk about those more on the next slide. Uh, you could also do this during re-entry. So if that person has served time, when you release them, you can mandate that they enter some sort of re-entry program that will help them with mental health issues, that will help them reintegrate into the community, things along those lines. And you can have community corrections and support. Um, so, you know, this could be as low level as someone who's on probation but being supervised, uh, sort of all the way up to, you know, again, making sure that person is getting intensive mental health treatment when they need it. And again, unfortunately, even though you know, our prison system in theory has the resources, right? Um, the medical and mental health care that people get in the prison system is usually less than adequate. I think that's the most tactful way to put it. All right, so the problem solving courts. The premise is that the legal system should help troubled individuals cope with chronic problems that built, brought them into contact with the criminal justice system. So rather than punishing them, let's actually address what's going on and stop them from, again, recidivism that way. The collaborative, non-adversarial nature of the specialty courts in which judges work side by side with mental health professionals, community agencies, and the offenders themselves focuses more on meeting the ongoing needs of participants than on punishing them. This approach, which the law, in which the law is used as a vehicle to improve people's life, is called therapeutic jurisprudence. So in the drug courts, they divert cases from the traditional criminal justice system and link drug addicted offenders with treatment programs and extensive supervision. So this wouldn't be, you know, you're only selling drugs. I mean, that's rare, honestly. If you're selling them, you're often using them, right? This is someone who clearly is having a substance use disorder and we're fully recognizing that is a mental health issue that is causing them legal issues, right? Rather than a legal issue that also has some mental health issues, right? So we're recognizing we should help that person rather than just punishing them. Um, the findings are pretty encouraging from these, although some drug courts work better than others. And obviously the hope in the future is that uh, we will take what is working and apply it more widely. Um, I think we need to do more of that type of what we call dissemination research in psychology. Someone in the therapy realm, we're starting to get into that, uh, but in most areas of psychology, we're not good at that. And I know the APA is working on some of that. Like, how do we get this information out so it can be applied? All right, so mental health courts. Uh, so back in the 60s and 70s, we had deinstitutionalization, which was the long-term trend of closing mental hospitals and transferring care to community-based mental health treatment facilities. And that's left many mentally ill individuals without services, without medication, sometimes without homes or jobs, right? Because like you can't hold one depending on your type of mental illness, right? You're actively psychotic. You might not even know where you are, right? As a result, mentally, the mentally ill have experienced higher rates of homelessness, unemployment, alcohol and drug use, and physical and sexual abuse by others. They also experience high rates of incarceration but most local jails lack treatment resources. According to the criminalization hypothesis, a subset of mentally ill off offenders committed and were arrested for offenses caused by their untreated symptoms of mental illness. So just like we were saying with drug courts, we're recognizing that what got them in trouble with the law was caused by their addiction. Here we're saying, you know, 
these whatever it was public disturbance what have you was caused by their mental health issues right mental health courts were developed to decriminalize this population if the offender is diverted into a mental health court the mental health team prepares a treatment plan to lead to long-term psychiatric care and reintegration into society close monitoring is essential the, and the charges are dismissed only if the offender follows the treatment plan, right? If they're not able to, and they give them some chances, obviously, but if they're not able to follow it, they would be diverted back into the main system. Evaluations of mental health courts suggest that they have been moderately effective in linking individuals to treatment services and reducing recidivism. Uh, again, uh, as long as the participants, the offender, gets their full dips, right? They stick with it. They get all the therapy they're supposed to be getting and engage with all the resources they're supposed to. There are two concerns associated with these courts. So some people worry that participants may feel coerced into doing this, in which case, like, are we violating their rights in some way at that point? And the second convert concern involves the selection of participants. Uh, so there's some evidence that there's a gender and racial bias here. Um, and it could be selection bias, you know, who gets diverted here. Um, and maybe that is actually why we seem to do well. Maybe we're only taking the people with like the least severe symptoms, right? So yeah, these courts are doing great. All right. Homeless courts are designed to reach out to marginalized individuals, address the underlying problems that resulted in their homelessness, and reintegrate people into society. So I know, again, that I have um, CJ majors and minors, right? As we talk about these problem-solving courts, I'm sure you all are tying this back to other classes you've taken, right? This certainly shows you how CJ relates to sociology, right? The whole idea that like, look, we can't just punish the person, right? Sometimes we need to figure out what is the sociocultural issue going on here that we can try to help that person address. So um, these courts are typically held in shelters or agencies that serve the homeless population because, as you can imagine, for people who are homeless, sometimes getting physically to the court can actually be really difficult. So imagine you were in Virginia Beach being put on trial, right? Like, the courthouse is kind of in the middle of nowhere, right? I, I'm guessing there's public transit that goes there, but it wouldn't be a short ride, right? Um, you know, as opposed to if you're in like downtown Norfolk, maybe you can just walk there, okay, right? Uh, but definitely, you know, can be a challenge, we'll put it that way. Okay, so domestic violence courts. In recent years, domestic violence courts have coordinated efforts to hold perpetrators accountable, enhance victim and child safety, and promote informed judicial decision-making. These courts differ from other specialty courts in that they start from the premise that the offender's behavior is learned rather than rooted in a treatable addiction or illness. Therefore, court proceedings are primarily adversarial rather than therapeutic, so it's a little bit distinct from the other ones. Both victims and perpetrators uh, after going through this system, express satisfaction with the court process and the outcomes. Perpetrators who go through a specific domestic violence court, as opposed to more traditional court proceedings, are more likely to comply with any judge ordered conditions, whether that's a no contact order or what have you. In community courts, these are neighborhood focused courts that are designed to address local problems like vandalism, prostitution, shoplifting, vagrancy, whatever your you know sort of flavor of the week is in your neighborhood. Participants generally like how they're treated in this court, such as uh, you know often there are alternative sanctions. Maybe you help to clean up what you vandalized. And then veterans courts. In a typical veterans court, a district attorney may opt to defer prosecution or 
offer a plea bargain to a reduced charge if it is clear the offense was related to the veteran's disability, such as PTSD. And the veteran agrees to seek treatment. And with veterans, this is really easy, right? We just get them set up with the VA. Now, does that mean they'll always get treatment right away? No, like the VA has some staffing issues and some organization issues, right? That fully acknowledge, especially having worked at one, that the VA has issues. However, it does exist, right? And it is a nice avenue rather than, you know, sometimes trying to have to track down an organization that will actually treat the person. Offended, offenders who are diverted to veterans court are less likely to reoffend and those whose cases go through the traditional criminal justice system. So in general, these all seem to reduce recidivism. Um, I don't have a slide particularly for it, but there are some criticisms of these courts. One concern is that the specialty courts are presided over by traditionally middle-class or upper middle-class judges who reflect those values, right? And who may become inappropriately paternalistic in what they require of people, right? So they um, can be sort of condescending, uh, have difficulty understanding the social cultural implications, socioeconomic implications of what these people are experiencing. Others have argued that problem solving courts lack legitimacy because threatening punishment to coerce rehabilitation is unfair and because guilt or innocence is not determined by a trial in these scenarios. Um, so people say, well, if you tell people well, you have to go to mental health court or you're probably going to prison, right? Is that actually gonna help them get better if they're being, it's like treatment's just their get out of jail card, right? Um, prosecutors feel pressured in these courts to favor rehabilitation of the offender over protection of society and defenders feel pressure to plead their clients guilty and inform the court of their clients failure to comply with the terms of probation. Researchers worry about the lack of rigorous empirical studies that assess how these specialty courts actually influence or fail to influence offenders' conduct. So this is a, a nice place for psychologists and criminologists to get involved in some research. Alrighty, so as I mentioned, um, I have just a version of well, the books straight up PowerPoint for uh, the punishment and sentencing section. Um, it's awful. I really hate how books do PowerPoints. They basically like translate, uh, I almost like copy paste everything in the chapter onto slides. Um, typically I sit and I edit these, um, but I just didn't have time this week. So um, like I said, let me get my captions back up here. So like I said, I'm gonna do sort of a, a highlights version of this. We're gonna skip through a lot of this. Um, if anyone is interested, I can post this, but honestly, just read the chapter. <laughs> You'll get most of the same information, but they're just some things I want to highlight. And so I think it is important to talk about why on earth we do punish people. Why do we sentence them to things, right? Especially just given our conversation about, you know, these rehabilitative courts and how well they seem to do. So the purpose of the sentence can depend on the nature of the crime, the characteristics and experiences of the offender, the temperament of the judge, and sometimes public sentiment. Um, so for example, I'd be really surprised in the Derek Chauvin case if he doesn't get more than the minimum punishment because of public sentiment. Now, do I think he should have more than minimum punishment? Sure, but I'm part of the public, right? So I think that that's sort of interesting. There's a lot of discretion and a lot of wiggle room. So for example, I was reading an article about the Chauvin case and that's like for just one of his charges, like the minimum is 10 years, but the maximum is 40 years, right? So that's a big difference in how much of your life it can affect. And so we do see sentencing disparities pop up. And unfortunately, a lot of times, just like some of the other stuff we've talked about with the criminal justice system, these are racially based, gender based, socioeconomic status based. So again, I'm gonna kind of skip through these. 
Um, there are racial disparities. <clears throat> so, as you can see, a third of African American boys will born uh, will spend some time in prison. That's just absurd when you compare it to only one in seventeen white males. Um, and Again, I have to be very like cautious here because this is not my area of research, right? But from the reading I've done of other people's research, it's not necessarily that white people are offending less. It's just they're getting away with it. I feel like that's safe to say based on the research out there. Um, there are racial disparities among female offenders, um, but, uh, you know, it's, Crime rates are much lower. I was actually just talking to my abnormal class about this this morning. A lot of this has to do with the social perceptions of what's acceptable for women, even in deviance, right? So it's much more acceptable for men to act in a violent way, for example, whereas um, you know women uh, may instead act out in different ways. Um, there are these different goals of punishment. Y'all can read those over. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to kind of skip through these um, and talk more. I did want to talk about judicial discretion. So sentencing is a judicial function. So the judge is traditionally the one who makes these decisions. Many legislators, legislators believe that judges should have little or no discretion that there should just be mandatory sentences, um, they, there should be sentencing guidelines, and some people think we should just get rid of parole altogether. Because there are people who reoffend while they're on parole. Obviously the extreme fictionalized version of this was in the episode of, the, of Detroit 187 that we watched, um, but certainly there are other cases where they're not quite as dramatic, but still problematic. Other legislators say judges should have discretion to make the sentence fit the crime and also the criminal. So some states have what they call indeterminate sentencing. Judges impose a variable period of incarceration for a given offense. So judges aren't just given a window by which they can sentence, they actually sentence a window, if that makes sense. So six to 20 years. And then a parole board will actually determine when that person is released. So it's like the judge kind of like diverts, kicks the ball downfield, it's someone else's problem. Other states have determinate sentencing. Offenders are sentenced for a fixed length of time. Um, judges have little choice about the length of sentences and there's no parole. Some states do impose mandatory minimum sentences for certain offenses. These are absurd. If you've ever done any of the reading into uh, mandatory minimum of, uh, sentences for drug crimes, like just like possession of an ounce of marijuana, I forget what the minimum is, but it's like years. It's absurd, right? And this has really tied people's hands and is a big part of why we have so many people behind bars, particularly people of color, because people of color are even more likely to get convicted for drug offenses even though white people use them at as high of rates, you know, depending on the population, sometimes higher rates. Again, skipping forward, um, in 2005, they decided the mandatory nature of the guidelines was unconstitutional. Fe federal sentencing guidelines are now advisory, but Again, the Supreme Court can't necessarily tell the state courts what to do, so that might be different. So for the sentencing process, the judge gets a file on the offender that contains information about their history and their prior conviction. They're going to review that file before the sentencing hearing. Um, and then recommendations for a sentence are presented by the prosecutor and the defense attorney. Um, and judges' sentencing decisions are going to be really influenced by those prosecutors' requests. Um, those are anchors. And then defense attorney sentencing is also influenced by the prosecutor. So just like, let's say you're suing someone we were talking about, right? And then you say, 
I want $100 million, right? So even if you're not going to get the $100 million, right, it's going to downshift from there. So you might end up with like $60 million. Um, as opposed to if you said, I want $10 million, so you might end up with $6 million, right? So those anchors are really important. They're a starting point. <laughs> The judge also has a probation officer's report and recommendation. The judge may ask the offender questions. The offender can often make a statement. Uh, if it's relevant, then a forensic mental health professional may provide input. Um, and then the judge will deliver the sentence. So we've been talking about front end, front end sentencing. And now we'll talk about back end sentencing. Uh, and this is when parolees are arrested for new crimes or violate conditions of their parole in other ways. So then they are returned to the prison. And this is now approximately a third of all people who are imprisoned. So um, sentences do relate to crime severity. That's good. We would hope that's true, right? Um, the criminal record is relevant. So if you have previously offended, you're much more likely to get a harsh punishment, a longer sentence because you're sort of showing that you're not learning, essentially. Um, so men are more likely to be sentenced to prison and serve longer sentences for property and drug offenses, uh, but if it's a violent offense, there doesn't seem to be as much of a gender differential. So the focal concerns theory argues that judges focus on three concerns, the defendant's culpability, trying to protect the community, and then practical constraints and consequences. Um, and this can include things like they have kids or they are the main support for their family. Again, gender um, of the victim also comes into play. So offenders who victimize females receive longer sentences. This goes back to some of the stuff we've talked about before in terms of trying to protect women. Uh, this is called benevolent sexism, the idea that women are precious and need to be put on a pedestal. Um, and it seeps into our culture in a lot of different ways. And this is just one example. Like, in theory, it shouldn't matter the gender of the person you victimize, right? Uh, race of the offender does affect it. Nothing about that surprises anyone in this class, right? Um, African Americans are sentenced more harshly, even when they do the same crime. And again, not shockingly, the disparity is larger for drug offenses. Um, is it a guilty plea or is it a trial? That can also influence sentencing. So if you plead guilty, you're often given a reduced sentence, maybe as part of your plea deal. Um, you know, if you go through a trial, you don't have that option. And the judge's background and personal characteristics can also influence things. You know, they're human. As much as we like to think of judges as sort of like the pinnacle of the law, they're people, they're imperfect, right? Okay, so juveniles, and this was the big thing I wanted to make sure that I talked about and why I decided to use this god awful PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> so I think this is really important to talk about because this is going to have long term implications for the juvenile offender and other people they come in contact with, right? So sometimes they're arrested, but sometimes they're referred by school officials, social service agencies, or even their parents. Oh, this, sorry, this just reminded me of, I only saw a couple adolescents in my life and one of them was this girl who had been abused by her father and um, her mom denied it was abuse, even though the dad had like hit her and stabbed her with an extension cord and um, they would call the cops on her whenever they argued with her. And I left to go defend my dissertation. I was gone for like three days. And in those three days, they had her arrested and sent off to essentially like a boot camp. 
I have like never been more sad and more like incised in my life that something a client did um, because it meant I had no closure with her. I, I didn't know if she thought I was part of that process and I had really been in her court, right? Um, so I just felt for her. And then, you know, a couple months later I left and I came here. So I never got to see her again. So yeah, it's tough. With sentencing juveniles, most often the focus is going to be on intervention, corrections, rather than punishment, trying to help this person become a better person. Um, so you have to decide, are they going to go to the court system? Are they going to go to an alternative program? So there are just like drug treatment programs. Thank you, Hayden. Yeah, that was a really tough case. Wow, I haven't even like thought about it in a couple of years and that like made me profoundly sad just talking about it. But stuff like that happens sometimes. You know, and sometimes as therapists, there's only so much we can do. Um, so if you are going through the court system, um, then you have to decide, is it going to go through juvenile court or is it going to be transferred to adult criminal court? And there's a lot of things that affect that decision. It could be um, age of the of the juvenile, you know, if you're above, I think, like 15, 16, you might be more likely to be transferred. Seriousness of the crime, right? So if it's murder, it's much more likely to be transferred to adult criminal court. Judges beliefs about the deterrent effects of transfer, the possibility that juveniles will refrain from committing crimes in the future because they fear of being trying as adults can affect these decisions. So about two thirds of people who go through juvenile court are found to be delinquent, which is like, I love the term for you, right? That's not problematic or stigmatizing language. And they go on to sentencing, or in this case, it's called the dispositional phase. And so these hearings will have adversarial procedures and attention to the needs of the juvenile, whether those are social, psychological, or physical. The goals of these dispositions um, can uh, be reflected in these options. So they can be committed to a severe, secure facility. This is, you know, again, often the most at risk, the most violent crimes. They could be on probation with intense supervision. They might go to a group home or some sort of lower security residential placement. Um, day treatment or a mental health program, or sometimes it's just a fine, community service, restitution paying the person back. So as you can see, a lot of them are given probation. Basically, our justice system, as messed up as it is, recognizes that putting people into prison at a young age is not actually going to be corrective. It's probably going to be instructive in bad ways, right? Um, but there are a quarter who end up in some sort of out of home placement. You might, uh, you know, if you are transferred to the adult court, you might end up with what's called a blended sentencing. Um, so then they can use both the juvenile options or the criminal uh, court or the adult criminal court options. So they can get more lenient sentences or they can get harsher sentences if they are reoffending, violating their probation, or um, you know, not responding to the help that they're being given. About half of serious delinquents released early uh, were re-arrested for a felony. So there is some suggestion that perhaps they should, if you've been referred to adult court, you should be sentenced as if you were an adult, essentially. You can get life in prison when you're a juvenile. And that's a little mind boggling, right? Because you might be 15 and you're sentenced to life in prison. And again, this isn't something that is at least supposed to be thrown around lightly. These would be, you've murdered someone, right? 
if you are being tried as an adult, in some jurisdictions, life sentences are mandatory. Um, particularly if you, again, convicted of murder, attempted murder, or, um, you know, essentially were an accessory to a murder or were part of another crime that related to a murder. Some people say that's cruel and unusual, just face value. Um, others say these are helpful to the victims and make the victims feel safe or the victim's family in the case of a murder, right? Um, a public sentence uh, sentiment usually is an end to this. In the case of murder, they'll be like, okay, but it's really hard to wrap your head around locking up a kid for life, right? Okay, so sex offenders. Sex offenders um, are very likely to reoffend, like people with antisocial PD that we talked about earlier. They don't really respond well to any kind of treatment or punishment. Um, a lot of times they just don't understand what they were doing is wrong. They don't see it as wrong. And so we have to kind of take that into account when we sentence sex offenders. Many sex offenders have committed more sex crimes than the ones for which they were arrested. Um, so we may have an underestimate. It could be they're better at covering it after they get caught, sadly. Right? Um, so basically the way we sentence sex offenders is in almost entirely wrapped around protecting the public. So you have to register with state officials who notify the community. Um, and you, there is an online website, actually <laughs> we're chatting. Um, I'll try to pull it up um, and remember how you find it, but it's like a sex offender registry and you can just put in your uh, address and uh, yeah, it's just National Sex Offender Registry. I'll throw it in the chat. Um, you just put in your address and you can see who lives around you. Uh, actually, one of my supervisors in the internship was like, have you looked at the sex offenders or you? And I was like, what, why? <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, after that I did. <laughs> um, and so you can always see where these people live. And in some states, I know they've talked about like making their license plates a different color so they're really recognizable. They're often prohibited from living um, within certain distances of schools, daycare facilities, parks, and basically any place where there's gonna be a lot of kids, particularly if their sex offense was pedophilia. They can be involuntarily committed um, to a mental health facility. Um, and then uh, they can have enhanced sentences, mandatory treatments. The other thing that is not an official sentence, but that is recognized is that even hardened criminals don't like people who abuse kids sexually. And so oftentimes sex offenders are subjected to additional abuse by their fellow inmates uh, once they figure out what they're in there for. So as we mentioned, they have to register, uh, but some of them don't comply, uh, especially if they move, say. Um, sometimes there's harassment of sex offenders because of that, because of the registration. Is this hard, right? Because we want to recognize the rights of these people as people, but also like, I find it really hard to be sympathetic to someone who abused children. I'm guessing other people feel the same way. Um, registration laws also just might not really do anything, it seems like. Um, the buffer zone around schools, parks, and bus stops uh, exists. This is gonna make it really hard for sex offenders to find some place to live. Um, but the idea was like, oh, well, that's why they won't prey on kids in those facilities. But as you can see, the vast, vast majority of sexual offenses are committed by a person known to the victim. So like, does not living near an elementary school actually do anything if who they abused was like their niece or nephew, right? This is, I think in a lot of ways, akin to some of the protective things we try to put in place for rape, right? Like, 
oh, well, carry a rape whistle and have some mace and things like that when, like, the vast majority of the time, it's not going to be someone who jumps out at the bushes at you, right? It's going to be someone you know. Like, a friend of mine in undergrad was raped while she was trying to study with a guy she thought was her friend. Right. So, again, involuntary commitment can happen. Um, and then once you're in there, you're not getting out. So it's like a life sentence, but only you're in a uh, forensic mental health facility instead of prison. They have to have some sort of mental abnormality or personality disorder. So often these folks have antisocial PD and also, you know, like a pedophilia or something like that. Oh, Jesus Christ, Jane, that's terrifying. <laughs> There's too many. Uh, yeah, I know I know where one of the ones in my neighborhood is. Um, I actually, a few years ago, had to like report his house, not because of anything related to a sex offender, but his grass got really long. And I was just like, look, he's older. Can you check and make sure he's alive? Uh, but I think he just wasn't there because I've seen him since. Um, yeah, doesn't surprise me. Um, Wesleyan is in a place that's sort of weird and I can articulate this because I don't live very far from Wesleyan. So Wesleyan, if you go a little further away like to Ridgeland Manor or um, even the neighborhood closer to uh, Wesleyan and Northampton, there are a lot of like really nice pricey houses, but then there's a lot of really low income housing around there too. And in particular the like Taylor section, um, is known for being sort of a crime hotspot, unfortunately. Um, you have to be able to control your behavior. Okay, okay. Yeah, you guys get all this. Again, these are awful. Sometimes you are mandated. The crime rates are very, very high. Oh, that's really interesting, <laughs> Nyla. I could imagine that would be really interesting to look at. Yeah, um, I mentioned to you all before that I have a friend who's a Virginia Beach police officer, and he actually is in the precinct that includes the college, and he's, you know, always telling me things. <laughs> I'll be like, well, yeah, I live in a safe neighborhood, and he's like, but I've chased people through your neighborhood, Terry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's a weird mix because obviously also we don't want to make generalizations that something will happen because of the neighborhood we're around. And in fact, Dr. Stoley and other folks have really tried to make connections to the community. I think the new agreement where we'll be sharing a minister with one of the local churches may also help with that. Um, but yeah, it's certainly, it can be touch and go, we'll put it that way. That being said, when Dr. Hinsey was here, he lived right around Lake Taylor and he never had a problem. Uh, so they tried to cure sex offenders, which I've mentioned already, not actually a thing really. Um, and some of these treatments can be uh, really severe. Um, so in the past in particular, um, we've done things like Aramide electric shot with um, like show them a picture of whatever they're particularly um, attracted to porn wise and then give them a mild electric shock and in the past we've actually done that with shocks directly to the genitals. I don't think we do that anymore. Uh, freshman got robbed at knife point outside the gate. Yeah Naila I think it was my second or third year here there were um, two students held at gunpoint at the 7-Eleven. Um, and that was a whole kerfuffle, not only because of that, they were fine, but um, the Chronicle covered it as they should as a newspaper. And uh, it happened to be like a visit day. And the, the head of admissions went around and took all the Chronicles off the, uh, the racks. <laughs> Hooray, censorship. <laughs> um, Luckily, the higher ups did correct it, but it was just sort of ludicrous, right? Um, because anyone can do the type of research y'all just, just ju y'all just did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, technically they're right, but that doesn't mean morally they're right, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Um, the other thing that has been done in the past, and some argue this is cruel and unusual, is chemical castration. So you give people a cocktail of medications that basically makes it so that they maybe either can't get an erection or don't get uh, sexual urges. So this actually happened to uh, Alan Turing, um, who was a brilliant uh, mathematician, computer programmer, uh, came up with the way to detect and decode Nazi transmissions during World War II that helped us win that war. He was British, he was gay. And so their thanks to him was actually to chemically castrate him um, because he was a sexual deviant for being gay. And he eventually died by suicide, which is just, it's horrible. Um, so there's actually a really good movie um, about that, and I believe Benedict Cumberbatch plays Turing. Yeah, some states you can't even get parole if you're a sex offender unless you're on this cocktail for chemical castration. Um, okay, so death penalty, I'm not gonna get it too into this other than um, this is very controversial. Some people argue it's a burden to the system not to just get rid of people. Um, the other hand, we have more and more cases of people on death row who are being exonerated by DNA evidence. Virginia just outlawed the death penalty. And as you can see, the Bar Association has called for a nationwide moratorium. At, yes, we did just abolish it. Yeah. And at the end of Trump's presidency, there had never been in like 10, 12 years, something, there hadn't been any federal uh, executions. And then he went and executed a whole handful of people. And they were all like really questionable um, cases, like the first Native American person to be put up for the death penalty for something that happened on tribal land. Um, so yeah, if you ever questioned Trump's moral character, like that should make you think even more. If you haven't questioned it, it should definitely make you think even more. Um, I, again, I'm gonna skip through this. Um, it's, you know, there's an argument for it. Over the course of my life, I certainly have come down against it um, simply because of what's on this slide. Um, at least two to three percent may actually be innocent and there are innocent people who have been executed that's not what we're in the business of right that's why these police shootings are so problematic because they are not judged jury and executioner right their job is not to just go around and kill people for holding a knife who are 13 years old and a girl who called them for help right Here's another example. So serious mistakes have been made in two thirds of the cases, including incompetent defense attorneys, faulty jury instructions and misconduct on the part of the prosecutors. So again, this is why I don't think we should be putting people to death on court proceedings that aren't great, right? Um, so the Innocence Project is a big piece of this. Um, if you're not familiar with them, again, I'll, I'll Google it real quick and grab the uh, URL for y'all. Um, for anyone who listened to Serial, uh, the podcast, uh, they were a big part of trying to get Adnan uh, out of prison. Um, so they do stuff with DNA evidence, but they also can do stuff with more modern technology in general. So a lot of people who are on death roll, for example, um, were put in prison before we had the technology to analyze DNA evidence. So I just feel like everyone should go through and analyze that, right? Yes, yes, I a lot. This is, and racial biases are really common with this. And then of course there are the horror stories of cases uh, yes, I think you're right, too, um, that, you know, <laughs> were, it wasn't even the death penalty, they're just lynchings after these cases, so uh, 
Emmett Till is the case that comes to mind, right? Um, and if you don't know his case, Google it. Uh, but he was essentially a- accused of like whistling at a white woman, um, and which he never did. And after his trial, they literally just pulled him apart, basically. It's horrifying. Um, that was actually one of my favorite protest signs I saw last summer was someone had a sign that said, I'm still mad about Emmett Till. Um, there was some connection recently where like someone who used to babysit Emmett Till like knew one of the Minnesota victims might have been George Floyd. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, it's just really overwhelmingly devastating. So some states are kind of counting for this new technology. Um, You give death row inmates the right to post-conviction DNA testing um, and Congress does have a grant to try to help with that. People have to know that that's there though, right? Again, I'm gonna skip through these justifications uh, and the things for or against, right? Again, if just like with the gender stuff we looked at, you're much more likely to get a death sentence if you kill someone who's white than if you kill someone who's black. So again, whose life is worth more? That's what we're trying to argue with this, even though people don't realize it. So if you are going to be sentenced to death, you have to have something specifically called a capital jury because it's capital punishment. Um, So, White male jurors are more likely to vote to execute a black defendant than any non-white or any female jurors. So clearly we see biases coming through. Honestly, probably in both directions. But, you know, one kills a person and the other one doesn't. Um, So again, skipping through, skipping through, skipping through. Um, there's the whole bunch about this year. So the Supreme Court has um, limited when the death penalty can be used. So in particular, uh, defendants who are developmentally delayed, at that time they were still using the language retarded, which we don't use anymore. People with mental illness or people who uh, were juveniles at the time of the murder. So the Supreme Court at least recognizes like Basically, in those scenarios, they're like, well, the whole point of the justice system and the prison system in particular is to, like, have that person be punished for their crimes. And if they don't understand why they're being punished in this way, then it's cruel and unusual. So, again, skipping forward here. I think that's finally the last slide. 87 slides, but I could have probably put on 10. Uh, so um, I'm going to stop share uh, so I could read the chat here. Um, Fred Hampton's mother. Yes, 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 yes. We have watched Judas and the Black Messiah. Highly recommend it. I think it's on HBO Max. Does that sound right? I think that's where we watched it. Uh, where the FBI uh, assassinated this guy. He was a Black Panther leader and they got a guy to like infiltrate uh, they killed Hampton. It was a very Breonna Taylor thing. They killed him while he was in his bed um, asleep. And um, his wife was next to him pregnant at the time. Uh, she survived. The baby survived. Thank goodness. Um, but I think she was also shot. Um, yeah, there are a lot of cases where the federal government has been involved in people's deaths. You know, and I'm sure in their minds it's justified. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the 60s, the 70s, I mean, even now, right? So I certainly don't want Osama bin Laden to be alive, right? But just the fact we went in and just shot him in the head, right? I know it's international and it's war and that's considered acceptable. Um, but, you know, where's due process, right? Where's putting him on trial for all of his crimes? Um, that being said, I wept with joy when Obama announced he was dead. Um, because again, I was in college at the time of 9-11 um, and it really profoundly affected our entire generation. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that, I highly recommend if you can watch Judas and the Black Messiah do um, because it gets at some of these issues of how people can be set up, manipulated, 
um, and how communities can come together. Like there's one point in the movie where like their office is destroyed and like everyone comes together to like put it back in a working order, which is really, really nice. So including the guy who's undercover, he helps. Um, so yeah. All right, so that is all I had for today. Thank you all for your great input um, and for bearing with me with this ridiculously onerous PowerPoint. <laughs> but I did want to make sure we got it because we had some time, we got just to talk about sentencing, particularly juveniles, because I think that's important to think about. All right, so I'll stick around for a minute in case anyone has any questions. Um, if not, I will see you all on Tuesday and we will do our last in-class assignment. <laughs>